What's up everybody? My name is Kina and I cover personal finance and investing. Today, I wanna to talk about passive income, the holy grail of financial independence. I think all of us are attracted to the idea of the money in our accounts increasing while we're sleeping, out with friends, or on vacation. I grew up being told that there's no substitute for hard work, there's no such thing as a free lunch, yada, yada, yada. And to a certain extent, this is true. A few years ago, I realized that it is truly possible to earn money without lifting a finger. But all strategies to do this require work on the front end to get them started. I won't sugarcoat it. Upfront effort is required. But once you have a system in place, generating money starts to require less and less effort. A $500 initial investment is not gonna be enough to generate Lambo money or be enough to ball out at the club every single night. But it is enough money to start off with one of the strategies that I'm about to discuss. And as soon as you see the numbers in your account increasing without you doing anything, I think you'll be hooked and wanna keep going down the rabbit hole to see how much you can earn. I've picked approaches that I think are possible for anybody to start while working a full-time job. There are plenty of people on the internet who suggest you build a drop shipping business or write an entire ebook. And while those ideas definitely can work to establish streams of passive income, I just, I don't think that's realistic for most of us because the time requirement is just so high. And with that being said, let's jump into how you can start generating streams of passive income, starting with as little as $500. Let's first look at index funds, which have been my go-to wealth generation tool for the last four years. During that time period, my index fund portfolio has generated roughly $71,000 in returns, 59,000 here in my main Vanguard account, and another 11 or 12,000 inside of a 401k account. Unlike individual stocks, index funds give you an ownership in a wide variety of companies, which diversifies your investment and protects you in the event that any one individual company underperforms or even goes bankrupt. There's an absolutely insane number of funds to choose from, including those which mimic entire economies, as well as funds that track specific industries and niches. Personally, I invested almost exclusively in VT Sachs during the first four years of my journey towards generating as much passive income as humanly possible. I'm still on that journey, by the way. This fund is designed to mirror the performance of the entire United States economy. You can buy one share of the fund today for about $110. And for that price, you get ownership of over 3,600 American companies. On average, we can expect broad index funds, such as VT Sachs, to generate an 8% annual rate of return. So if you took $500 today and invested it all in this fund, you could expect that money to grow to $540 by a year from now. $40 might not seem like a lot of money, but it's actually a pretty good return, given that you might only spend five or 10 seconds to buy the index fund, and then your money will go to work without you ever needing to do anything else. You can think of buying index funds like recruiting a bunch of worker bees to go out and bring nectar back to your hive. At first, you only have a few bees working for you, but over time, the bees recruit more bees and the whole situation starts to snowball and the amount of honey that's available to the hive starts to grow exponentially. That's a, <laughs> this is a great analogy. That's the beauty of compounding returns. And it's why it's so important that we start the process of building passive income streams as early in life as possible. That way, our worker bees have as much time as possible to gather nectar and recruit new bees to the cause. If broad index funds seem boring, and if you have some more time to dedicate to research, you can buy targeted funds that provide exposure to almost every economic niche you could think of. For example, say you saw that video a few months back about the first 3D printed house, and that got you thinking about how this technology might have the potential to disrupt conventional manufacturing. If we do a quick Google search, we notice that there are dozens of articles and industry reports projecting annual growth rates between 20 and 30%, which is much higher than the 8% that you could expect from a broad fund that accompanies the entire stock market. The beauty of targeted funds is that we don't have to spend hours and hours researching different 3D printing businesses and technologies to determine which particular company's stock to buy. Instead, we can buy an index fund that gives us ownership in all of the major companies working on these technologies. And this is exactly what I did earlier this year. And I now hold around 100 shares of ARK Invest's PRNT index fund which contains about 50 of the leading companies in this area. You can find index funds for virtually any economic niche by Googling the name of the sector, followed by index fund, and the name of your brokerage. I recommend doing research into the different index fund options that you have, 
so that you understand what underlying companies you're buying and what fees, if any, that the fund charges. I also live by the rule of only buying into industries or companies where I have a strong understanding of the business. In my opinion, if you buy something that you don't understand, it's not likely to end well. The next strategy is for those looking to generate passive income from the stock market, but with more predictability than an index fund. I'm talking about dividend investing. If you're interested in strategies that don't involve tying up money in the stock market, make sure you stick around as I'll get into non-investing approaches in greater detail later in the video. Dividend investing is a bit more risky than index funds because it requires you to buy individual companies and be less diversified. But it's not as risky as it might initially seem because the type of businesses that typically pay out dividends are generally large, stable value companies that are less likely to suffer a major financial setback. Now, of course, nothing is guaranteed, but one advantage of dividend stocks over index funds is that they will typically pay out even when the economy is struggling. So you can expect predictable quarterly payments even when times are bad. And this can be a major plus for folks who are retired or anybody that depends on their investments to cover monthly expenses. The average dividend yield for a company in the S&P 500 is only around 2%. But keep in mind that assuming you chose a solid company, the price of the stock can be expected to increase over time, meaning that you earn income from regular dividend payments as well as stock price appreciation. Also, you can find plenty of solid businesses that pay out higher dividend yields. As an example, let's look at AT&T, which currently pays a 7.4% dividend meaning that you could expect to be paid $37 a year after making a $500 initial investment in the company. It's important to keep in mind that dividends can always be reduced or cut entirely. And generally speaking, the higher the dividend yield, the greater the risk. But companies with lower yields can cut dividends unexpectedly as well. For example, Delta Airlines reduced their dividend from 2.8% down to zero in 2020 as a result of the global health crisis. A number of other consumer cyclical companies such as Carnival Cruise and Boeing, also suspended their regular dividend payments in 2020 for the same reason. If stable income is important to you, I recommend looking at the dividend aristocrats, which are companies that have increased their dividends every year for the past 25 years, or the dividend kings, which are businesses that have done so for 50 years or more. Here are the 31 companies that meet the criteria for being a dividend king, along with the number of years that they've increased dividend payouts. Think about it. Each company on this list was able to maintain stable payouts through seven recessions, the Vietnam War, the 1970s oil crisis, double digit inflation in the 1980s, the fall of the Soviet Union, the 9-11 attacks, the 2008 housing bubble, and the recent health crisis. Any of these companies are likely to be a rock solid choice. And with a $500 initial investment, you can get well on your way to building a dividend portfolio. So I think that's a great option. Next up, and my last investing related passive income strategy is to put your $500 in a REIT or real estate investment trust. Think of it this way, instead of going out and investing a ton of time and money buying a property and then finding and managing tenants, you could instead put your money in a real estate investment trust. The way REITs work is by getting money from a pool of investors and then buying buildings within a certain category whether they be commercial or residential. What this means for you is that you can own real estate without any of the hassle of buying and managing it yourself. The upside of this approach is that you won't receive any calls at 2 a.m. because the water heater burst and flooded the garage, and you won't have to deal with evicting tenants or anything like that. REITs also tend to pay out pretty well. For example, Physicians Realty Trust pays a 4.91 dividend yield, and currently owns 274 medical properties and outpatient facilities. Another example is the WP Carey REIT, which pays a dividend yield of 5.26% and owns over 1,200 diversified commercial properties. This one is especially interesting to me because the school I got my Master of Business Administration degree from uh, is also named after WP Carey. I didn't know that. Another option is to buy a ton of different REITs within an index fund. For example, in the past I've owned VNQ, which is Vanguard's real estate index fund ETF and holds about 200 different real estate investment trusts. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't acknowledge the downsides of REITs, so here they are. First, you can't leverage your money like you can when you buy real estate yourself, and you don't get the tax benefits and depreciation options that are available when your name is on the deed. I also think that the future of commercial real estate is somewhat up in the air. Commercial real estate down, residential real estate up. How up? big time up, crazy up. And as more and more businesses shift towards online only sales and hire more remote employees, uh, 
things might change. So it might be wise to do a bit of research if you're buying a REIT that holds commercial properties. Anyway, at the end of the day, I think REITs are a great way to get started generating passive income. And you could buy a few shares with as little as $500. Let's get into some non-investing approaches for generating passive income. Most of the strategies from here on out will require upfront time and dedication to get the ball rolling, but I've picked options with the potential to generate good quantities of passive income once you've put in the time to get them established. Let's start with selling an online course. Now, this option clearly isn't for everybody, but if you have a lot of domain knowledge in a particular area and you think people would be interested in the topic, taking the time to develop a course could be very lucrative. And this is a great time to get started because the global market for e-learning courses grew from 107 billion per year in 2015 to 250 billion in size today, and is expected to grow at a rate of over 20% per year, reaching a total size of 350 billion by the year 2025, according to this article from Forbes, citing data from the market research firm, Global Industry Analysts. Given all this growth, this might be the ideal time to jump in. And it's something you can definitely start with just $500. All you need is a microphone to record audio, a screen recording tool, and maybe some software like Microsoft PowerPoint to display content. Depending on the style of course, you might also want a camera to film yourself and possibly even a whiteboard. While this isn't an option that I've personally tried, I do have experience with writing educational content and putting it online as a result of starting this YouTube channel. And all it took for me to get started was a small investment in a shotgun microphone and the iPhone I already had to record video. I'm actually still using my smartphone. The video you're watching right now is filmed on a three-year-old budget iPhone XR, which might come as a surprise, but the reality is smartphone video has come a long way and can actually look pretty good. In terms of how much you can expect to make, well, I did some research and I learned that this really varies depending on which platform you use and how many people you get to sign up. But the sky is the limit, and I found a couple of examples of folks earning tens of thousands of dollars per month just from creating a popular course. There are dozens of platforms out there with different profit sharing models. For example, Udemy, I, I think I'm saying that right, uh, lets you choose how much your course costs and then just takes a flat 50% cut. Other sites have more complicated profit sharing formulas. For example, Skillshare charges a flat rate for students to access all the content on the site. And then revenue is shared with the course creator based on how many minutes of watch time the class receives. So it would definitely behoove you to research the different options and choose a platform that best serves you and your needs. Another thing that I realized while looking into this area is that many successful courses are relatively short, so you don't have to worry about creating dozens and dozens of hours of content. For example, this class on becoming successful on YouTube from the well-respected tech reviewer MKBHD is only an hour and 11 minutes long, and it's been taken by nearly 30,000 students including me. I, I kind of love that guy. So depending on the domain knowledge you have and the worldwide interest that exists for your given topic, this could be a very lucrative approach because once you've written and recorded the course content, it's basically hands off and could generate a significant amount of passive income with very little effort after you've put in the time up front to create the content. My next idea is a bit of a creative one and is to pay off any high interest debt that you may have. This is the part of the video where I suspect some people will scroll furiously down to the comments section and tell me that this is, this is clickbait. This isn't passive income. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you have high interest debt, using $500 to pay it down today creates an immediate and guaranteed return that is likely to be greater than any return you could get from the investing activities we just discussed. For example, if you owe money on a credit card with a 20% interest rate, paying it down will give you an immediate 20% return on your money because you'll save that amount on interest. There really aren't many ways to use your money for a 20% return. And the options that do exist become increasingly risky as the return increases, or they require a lot of sweat equity. The bottom line is if you have any debt with an interest rate over 5%, or if you owe money on credit cards, personal loans, student or auto loans, one of the best ways to invest your $500 is just to pay them down. Once you've tackled this kind of debt, you'll suddenly have a lot more money lying around that was being wasted on interest payments before. My next suggestion ties into this one, and it's also one that might get me some backlash, but it's to cut back on existing spending. Not only does this option not require you to spend any money, but it could also provide a big boost of cash each month that you could then take 
and use on another one of the passive income strategies discussed in this video. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average household in the U.S. spends $63,000 per year. And research from one poll concludes that the average American spends around $18,000 per year on non-essentials. That comes out to about $1,500 per month in spending that just isn't necessary. Just look at this list. From restaurants to impulse purchases and subscription boxes, there's a ton on here that could be reduced or even eliminated. Now, I know that everybody's spending habits vary, but even if you're on the more frugal side of the spectrum, I guarantee that you could sit down and find some unnecessary expenses to cut. If you were a completely average spender like this article identifies and cut the entire $1,500 of non-essentials, that would result in you having an extra $125 per day in passive savings, which is almost the same thing as passive income. And then if you took that money and threw it into index funds or used it to support any of the other passive strategies from this video, you'd probably end up with a much larger nest egg five or 10 years down the road, and your future self would be thanking you for delaying gratification. Next up is affiliate marketing, which involves marketing somebody else's product, and then you make a small commission every time a sale is made. For example, just last week, I realized that I haven't cleaned my carpets once since moving into my house, and that it was really starting to be overdue. It's only been a year, guys. So naturally, I loaded up YouTube and started watching a ton of review videos. And here's one of the videos I watched. You can see the set of links in the description. Now, I already know that these are affiliate links, but it's nice to see that the content creator is transparent and has identified them as Amazon affiliate links. Ethically, that's the right move to disclose, so props to the guy at Vacuum Wars. Not only does he make great review videos, but he's honest. I see these links as a win-win. I get to learn about different products and I get the information I need to make an informed choice. And in return, the Vacuum Wars channel gets a small percentage of the sale if I end up using their link. I think that affiliate linking is a great option if you enjoy reviewing products. And you could easily get started doing this for less than $500. You just need a computer uh, if you're blogging and maybe a camera and a microphone if you're doing video reviews. There are definitely a lot of people doing this, but there's also an unending supply of new products being released so I think that oversaturation is not a huge issue. Also, I think that this can become more passive if you choose to review products that are more timeless, as opposed to products that are constantly being updated or refreshed. For example, a channel reviewing high-end Rolex watches would likely require a lot less work since each watch is updated only once per decade or so, meaning that your review would remain relevant and people could continue to use your affiliate links for many years. If we compare this against like uh, a channel reviewing smartphones or other tech gadgets, uh, they're typically updated once per year and you could see how constant work would be required to keep your reviews and your links relevant. So if you're willing to put in the time to make YouTube videos or write blog posts outlining your experience with a product and the pros and cons, this is almost a no brainer and it could be a really lucrative option. And this leads us smoothly into my next idea for passive income, which is the YouTube partner program. This can go hand in hand with affiliate marketing. If you're already reviewing products and gaining a commission through having people use your links, you absolutely should be monetized on YouTube so that you can receive a portion of the ad revenue that's generated from each video. Now, I realize that this is nowhere near as passive as some of the other options, and for that reason, I debated not including it at all because it takes a ton of work to start a channel, I would know, and because the YouTube algorithm rewards an active posting schedule. But as somebody who recently got started on YouTube, I see how certain content creators who've built up a reputation for themselves can still receive income for videos that they posted years ago, and this means that if you build a large enough presence and post enough videos, it is possible to generate passive income for months and even years after just walking away. Next, let's get into a more creative strategy, taking advantage of sign-up bonuses. Now, this does require a bit of work on your end, but the money you can make per hour invested is pretty dang high. The best sign-up offers out there are typically for opening new credit cards and meeting certain spending thresholds in a given time period. Folks who do this often refer to it as credit card churning because you open one card, you meet the requirement, you get the bonus, and then you move on to the next one. As an example, let's look at the Capital One Quicksilver card, which will pay you $200 just for opening the credit card and spending $500 on it within the first three months. Now, the smart way to do this is to shift existing expenses from your old cards onto your new one. Uh, you should never spend unnecessarily just to meet the signup requirement. But this one is pretty straightforward since I think most of us will spend more than $500 on a credit card in a 90 day period. So why not use this card exclusively until you hit the requirement? And then do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just kidding. 
the $200 is yours. There are cards that offer much larger bonuses in exchange for higher amounts of spending in the first three months. And there's also a lot of cards that offer points instead of straight up cash, like the Chase Sapphire card here that will give you 100,000 ultimate rewards points in exchange for spending $4,000 in the first 90 days. And this amount of points roughly translates to a $1,000 sign up bonus. Not too shabby. This can get a bit tricky, not only because of the higher spending requirement, but because you then have to redeem the points for cash or you can use them for travel purchases like airline tickets and hotels. But if you're willing to dedicate some time to figuring out how this card and each card works, you can repeat this process over and over again and make a solid chunk of change. For example, I keep a record of how much I've made from signup bonuses, and you can see that I earned about $1,400 here in 2019 and another $696 in 2020. Um, at the peak, I think I had like nine active credit cards, but uh, you know, I was doing that when I was younger and I, I don't do it so much now. If you're serious about doing this, make sure you pay the card in full every month. I can't stress this enough. And don't alter your spending patterns to hit the sign-up bonuses. If you weren't already going to spend $4,000 on a credit card over the next three months, do not sign up for the Chase, Chase Sapphire card. Chase Sapphire, well, I, I can't say words. There are two great resources out there if you'd like to learn more. The first is the credit card churning subreddit, which you can find by Googling credit card churning in Reddit. And the second is the Mad Scientist website, which lists all the current sign-up bonus offers. You can find that by Googling Mad Scientist credit card. Lastly, let's talk about participating in the sharing economy. If you're lucky enough to own a vehicle or a home, you can leverage those assets to create income that's relatively passive. For example, if you have a vehicle that sits unused for periods of time, maybe you work from home and you don't need it during the week, or maybe you need it to commute during the week, but you don't drive much on the weekend, you could offer it up as a short-term rental on Turo. Turo is a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing marketplace and is increasingly becoming a competitor to traditional auto rental companies. And I mentioned this option just because I have a good friend who regularly rents out his truck on Turo when he's going on vacation or doesn't need it for another reason. There are certain requirements. Uh, in general, the vehicle needs to be 12 years old or newer, have fewer than 130,000 miles, have a clean title, uh, some other things. But if you meet those standards and you live in an eligible state or region, uh, this could be a good option. Now, I say relatively passive because you need to screen and communicate with potential renters, and you also need to clean the vehicle or pay somebody else to do that for you uh, in between rentals. So it's not completely passive, but definitely an option that could net you some extra cash with minimal effort, depending on your situation. Of course, there's also Airbnb, which operates similarly, but for real estate that you might own. Like the Turo option, you need to be lucky enough to own a property, deal with communication with renters, and hire a cleaning service to keep things in order. I know folks who rent a single room in their house, so it's not necessary to own a secondary property uh, to do this one. Again, it's not completely passive, but it could be a lucrative option depending on your circumstances. At the end of the day, generating passive income will require time, money, or some combination of both. I think it's really about implementing multiple strategies that work well for you and fit with your lifestyle. That being said, Thank you for watching, and I hope you got some good ideas from the video. If you found anything here to be useful, please smash that subscribe button. It really helps me to grow, and I need everything I can get at this early stage. Thank you, and I'll see you all in the next one.